Psalm 116, verses 1 through 14. I love the Lord because He has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because He inclined His ear to me, therefore I will call on Him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, He saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed even when I spoke. I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all His benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all His people. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen.
first lesson for the third Sunday of Easter is written in the second chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, beginning at the 14th verse. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Let all the house of Israel therefore now know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. The second lesson is written in the first chapter of Peter's first epistle, beginning at the 17th verse. If you call on him as Father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for your sake, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, Love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding Word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the Word of the Lord remains forever. And this Word is the good news that was preached to you. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. The third lesson is written in the 24th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke, beginning at the 13th verse. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying, that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he was going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, 
while he opened to us the scriptures. And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Proclaim his salvation from day to day. Give to the Lord of glory and strength. Give him the honor to his name. Alleluia, alleluia. Now is Christ risen from the dead and become it the first fruits of them that sleep. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The long road to Emmaus, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Dear frightened disciples, let us start from the beginning. Jesus approaches these two disciples as they're wandering away from Jerusalem. They're leaving because of the trouble in that great city. And it is a great city, and there is a lot of turmoil going on. The Lord has been crucified. The disciples are in hiding. Jesus' body is missing, and there are some reports that he has risen. Now, it's most likely that these two disciples are returning to their homes, They've gone through this weekend. They've witnessed the horrific events of Christ's passion and his death. They've had their time for the Passover. On the Sabbath, they rested. And it seemed to be that they are in bewilderment now as they head down this road. All these events have passed, and they're on their way to their homes. Now, this is still Easter Day. Jesus of course, knows what they're talking about as he approaches them on this road. And as a true teacher, though, he lets them first say what they know about what's going on. And they know that things did not turn out as they had planned, not what they were hoping would take place. They had planned for a glorious kingdom on earth. They wanted earthly peace. They wanted to be able to worship this Lord in the temple in Jerusalem. They wanted him to restore a kingdom that was now ruled by Rome. Instead, in horror, they watched this false trial, his horrible passion, his death, and now his closest disciples are hiding in fear. Now, even though this was just as Christ himself had told them, they still didn't get it. And you can hear a sense of desperation in their voice as they're in this time of trial and tribulation. Listen to some of the words that they say. Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Remember, they're saying this to Jesus. Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucify him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things have happened. Do you hear the desperation? You know, he was, we had, uh, it's, it's, you know, he's been long dead now. This is the third day. And you have to kind of really love the irony because here they are telling Jesus what happened 
to him. I think he's probably aware of what happened. But Jesus is patient. It's part of his nature. He listens to them. But then he does give them a rebuke. He says, O oh, foolish ones, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter his glory? You know, Jesus points them back to the facts, and, and not the facts of his betrayal and crucifixion. They're, they got that down pat. They were there for all those things. They're witnesses. But instead, he points them farther back. He leads them back to what was foretold. Was it not necessary? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scripture the things concerning himself. It's as if he's saying, you can talk about me and all that happened, but let me tell you what was spoken of long ago that now has its fulfillment. And Jesus is not just a great guy that came to do nice things to the people on earth, but he is the fulfillment of all that man has needed since death entered the world. All that has been foretold would be needed since death entered the world. He's the cure for sin. He's the end of, of death. He is destroyer of the grave. Now, I was recently reading in, in Genesis the account of Abraham where his... Uh, uh, sacrifice of Isaac was thwarted. Abraham was commanded by God, give your own son as a sacrifice. But God halts this execution of Isaac and provides a ram in the thicket. But what I found was interesting is what God says to Abraham about the promise to his offspring. And listen to these words. I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sands that is on the seashore. And here, this part, and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. Your offspring shall possess the gate of, your, of his enemies. That phrase right there. Now, in military language, if you know to think about it, to possess means that you are now in control of it. So, in other words, uh, if you possess the hill, then you're in control of it. You possess the valley or, you know, or the passageway. You, you're in control of it, all right? So to control the gate of your enemy means that you are the one that has access to it, and, and it's very specifically to the enemy's fortress. You control the way in and out of his abode. The place of his power and dominion has now become yours. And this is why when we think, you know, in, in military or, you know, defending our homes or our castles, the gate is so important. Well, Jesus is the offspring of Abraham that was promised. He has taken possession of the gate of the enemy. He has control of it. And that gate is the grave. It's, it's the tomb. He has entered into the realm of our wily foe and burst the strong man's gate. He has opened to all who were caught in death a way to everlasting life. This is why the Lord chastises these disciples. They had not believed the word that Christ gave to them when he was teaching them that this is necessary. They had forgotten that this is exactly what he had to do, what he said he was going to do. Suffer, die, be buried, be put into the enemy's stronghold. If this did not take place, right, if Christ had not gone through these things, then the grave would not have been undone and lost its power to hold us. Now again, I think it's very interesting to get his disciples to understand this. What does he do? He starts from the beginning with Moses, the prophets, and interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. This must have been quite a walk with those disciples down that road. To understand who he is, they're going to need to know what was said about him, what was foretold. And the good news is this, nothing has changed. When life is giving us all sorts of trouble, when we are filled, in other words, with all kinds of doubts and fears, we need to do only one thing. We need to return to the word of God. We need to dive deep into all that the Lord has told us of his saving work for his fallen creatures. 
You see, we're no better off than the disciples. We are slow of heart toward the Lord. He has given us all the things necessary for our body and soul, everything that we need. He provides from his creative hand the things that we see, smell, taste, touch, hear. And when these things begin to fail, when we can't see, when we can't hear, when we can't taste, we can't smell, when we can't touch, we should not think that God has been defeated. That's where those disciples were. Jesus has been defeated because we can't touch him, we can't see him, we can't hear him. Instead, what we should do is we should return to the word of the Lord. In God's word, he never said that everything was going to be all right in this world. This world is cursed because of sin, and we are sinners living in a cursed world. It's like a, a double negative. It's, it, it's tough. It means that we're going to have trouble. We're going to have trials, tribulations, hardships, diseases, and separation. We especially know this today. We're going to have these things because that is what God has placed upon us. But here is where we fail. Not in suffering hardship. Everybody's going to suffer hardship. Not in trying to make things better. We should all be doing that. And not in doing in all that we can to preserve this land and its people. We should be doing that. We're not failing in that sense. But we go wrong when in the midst of the trial and the tribulation and all these things, we can't see Jesus. Even when he's walking with us down this road. We can't see the resurrection, even though he has burst the tomb. Alleluia, he is risen. He is risen indeed, alleluia. The disciples are blinded by the devil, the world, and their own sinful nature. These three do not want us to hallow God's name or let his kingdom come. But here on this long road to Emmaus, the Lord is there strengthening them, keeping them firm in his word and faith. And he does it by beginning with Moses and the prophets and interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. This is why the most important thing that we can do when persecuted in any way is to dive into the word of God with all of our heart, soul, and mind. Then to share it with our neighbor as well. In each and every home, even though all we have is our family or the few people that we come into contact with, during this epidemic test, we should be gathered around our scriptures and our devotions, gathered with family that is in that home, reading the word of God and pondering over it, taking time to go through our catechism, to say our prayers, or even take some time now to open up your book of Concord and read through it, praying with and for one another at all times. This is coming to seem like a long road that we're walking on, but we are not alone it's been asked, so how long do you think this will go on? And, and you know, all these things are out there. We can watch the media at, at all times. We know what's going on. Uh, you know, what, what's the lifespan of the virus? Uh, how quickly does it spread? How does it spread? The number of susceptible, the most at risk. Have we, have we flattened that curve yet? Will it return? Are we going to have round two of, of this coronavirus? But have you asked, how long will it take for the word of the Lord to get through to the people? There's a couple spots in the scripture that made me think of this. Uh, Joel and 2 and Jeremiah where the Lord says this, Return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He relents over disaster. Or in Jeremiah chapter 18, if any time I declare concerning a nation or kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it, and if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do it. Or later in Jeremiah 26, and obey the voice of your Lord God, and the Lord will relent of the disaster that he has pronounced against you. You know, masks, uh, disinfectants, sterilizers, you know, so on and so forth. How about prayer, devotion, worship, faith? The Lord will walk down this road with us as long as it takes. It could be a long road. 
because we are, as Jesus said, foolish ones, slow of heart. But instead of rending your garments to make masks, maybe you should rend your hearts and return to the Lord. Perhaps he will relent of this disaster from which he has struck us. Whatever the case is, it is, it is clear from this encounter with his disciples that Jesus wants us above all in trial and tribulation, in fear and doubt, in calamity and persecution to go back to his word, to stay in his truth, to stay in his faith until we die. This is his good and gracious will. During this Easter season, as we celebrate it separated, we realize that we are not separate from the Lord. It would be well with us if we continue to remember that even though the grave threatens us, even though this uh, virus might come into our community and, and, and maybe take some of our loved ones or take our very own life, right? Even though the grave threatens us, it has no power, no power whatsoever. For our Lord of victory stands in the gate of the enemy. He has burst open the tomb. He has left it open that we might see through that grave to our life everlasting. He has taken control of the fortress of death and he has made it a portal to everlasting life. Alleluia, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let us go forth in peace in the name of the Lord. Amen. Now may the peace of Christ, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds on Christ Jesus, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen.
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, hear my prayer, and let my cry come to you. O God, through the humiliation of your Son, you raised up the fallen world. Grant to all your faithful people, rescued from the peril of everlasting death, perpetual gladness and eternal joys. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You have heard our pleas for mercy, O Lord, and given up your Son to be our Savior. Hear us now as we come to you on behalf of ourselves and all people according to their needs. Our hearts have burned in us, O Lord, as your word has been read and preached. Keep our faith from growing cold and grant us grace, that we may not waver in faith or succumb to temptation. Give to us and to our children receptive hearts, that we may hear and hearing believe and believing be steadfast in this faith and hope all our days. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You have cleansed us, O Lord, with water and the word in baptism. You have marked us as your own people. Give to us grace that we may live out this faith in holy lives, lifting up your name in word and works for as long as we live. Guide us that with souls purified by obedience to the truth, we may love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless your church, O Lord, that she may welcome the stranger in Christ's name and manifest the unity of the faith in the bonds of love. Gather together those who are separated and preserve their faith by your word until all precautions and shelter measures have passed. Bless Matthew presiding in our synod, Richard our district president, David our visit, circuit visitor and pastor. Bless those training for church work vocations. Bless each of us as we live out our baptismal vocation of worship, witness, prayer, and service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guard our nation, O Lord, that we may enjoy peace and security in the face of threat and danger. Bless Donald, our President, the Congress of the United States, Pete, our Governor, and all state and local officials, that they may fulfill their offices faithfully. Bless all emergency and medical workers and the members of the armed forces who protect us, and teach the nations the ways of peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Deliver us from all our afflictions and grant us strength to bear all our burdens, O Lord. Hear us in particular for all who remain on Zion's prayer list and those we name in our hearts. According to your gracious will, heal the sick, relieve those who suffer, comfort the grieving, and give peace to the dying. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Stay with us, O Lord, and be our strength in weakness and our hope in time of despair. Your gracious will once kept the saints in faith even unto death. Keep us, we pray, with them in your faith and fear, that we may be found faithful when Christ comes again in his glory to bring to fulfillment all things once and forevermore. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Through the breaking of the bread, O Lord, feed us, upon the flesh of Christ and grant us to drink His blood in faith. Forgive our sins, strengthen our faith, build up our unity as a congregation and synod, and equip us through this communion to love you and love one another as you have loved us. Preserve the faith of those who wish to receive this sacrament in the presence of the congregation but cannot, and grant them their desire soon. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Accept, O Lord, this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving we bring for all your goodness and generosity. And with our song of praise, accept our tithes and offerings that your church may have the resources to proclaim your gospel and care for the poor and those in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
These and whatever other things we need, O Lord, we pray you to grant us in the name of and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, whose death was, has made full atonement for our sin and whose resurrection has granted to us the promise of our own joyful resurrection to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, Almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings being ordered by your governance may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.